Hi, everybody. I'm Laurel Sauer. And I'm Alan Gerstel. Thanks for joining us for Heritage, a showcase of exciting, award-winning local programming that was originally written and produced by our partners at the Education Network. Tonight, a program that focuses on ladies' fashions, specifically ladies' hats. Back in the 1890s, no fashionable woman would be seen in public without a hat, ideally a hat adorned with bird feathers. The most beautiful feathers were so highly prized that they sold for more than the price of gold. Can you believe that? And because of the price and the demand, hunters then prowled the Everglades and decimated flocks of birds for their beautiful plumes, especially prized, were egret feathers. Tonight's episode is titled The Last Egret. It's based on a children's book by local historian Harvey Oyer. It tells the story of his family, the Pierce family, who were the first settlers of Hypoluxo Island back in the 1870s. Young Charlie Pierce and his friends try to cash in on the craze for feathers, but learn along the way that what they were doing was really wrong. This program, though, goes beyond just the slaughter of birds to show the importance of each species to the health of the Everglades. It also highlights why the Everglades is such an important resource for everyone living right here in South Florida. So get ready for some stunning photography, some wonderful student actors, and a look back at life in a very uncivilized South Florida as we bring you The Last Egret. other Everglades in the world. They are, they have always been, one of the unique regions of the earth, remote, never wholly known. Nothing anywhere else is like them. The miracle of light pours over the green and brown expanse of sawgrass and of water shining and slow moving below. The grass and water that is the meaning and the central fact of the Everglades of Florida. It is a river of grass. The Everglades is a mystery. Uh, so many people, I think, have misunderstood what the Everglades is. And they thought of it many years ago as just a nasty old swamp, uh, when in fact it is just an incredible wetlands that is our life support. It not only provides a habitat for all of the creatures that we have, uh, in the southern part of our peninsula and for a lot of migratory birds that are here uh, periodically, but it is the water supply for human consumption. It's the great reservoir. Well, there was a lot of dikes put in, a lot of water diversions. Um, a lot of it was to protect our, our homes on the coast. You know, we didn't want them to flood out when we had a lot of flood flooding going on. So a lot of these were flood control projects. But while the flood control projects were vital for property owners along the coast, they too wiped out many birds and animals that call the Everglades home. Instead of having a flowing system, we've, we've built all these barriers and, and, and segmented the Everglades so into the water conservation areas. So now we have a series of big ponded areas. And so what that's done is it's stopped the flow of water moving through the Everglades and that has had some pretty severe consequences for the wildlife of the Everglades. The wildlife also came under attack, literally around the turn of the last century. It was driven by a hot fashion trend, women's hats. There was a buildup going on from the mid 1800s up until the late 1890s um, where there was a more accessibility for the middle class to purchase um, hats and accessories and um, because there was, there was an economic growth happening. So milliners were increasing. Um, by the turn of the century, there were about 83,000 milliners in our country. Milliners make women's hats. A hat reflected a woman's status in society. 
and a hat adorned with feathers became the ultimate status symbol. Some feathers were much more expensive, so yes. And the more feathers you had, the more status symbol it was. And hence, that's why the middle class was, was doing that. It was making them look like they had more money, which is no different from what's been going on nowadays. As the demand for bird feathers increased, so too did the price of feathers. Ornamental feathers fetched $32 an ounce in 1903, or nearly twice their weight in gold. The price of feathers eventually rose to $80 an ounce. There were no laws to protect wildlife, so many hundreds of millions of birds were plundered by so-called plume hunters. Egret feathers were the most highly prized. You were not properly dressed as a woman without feathers emerging from your hat. It got to be so outrageous that egrets were stuffed and actually surrounded a hat, a full egret. For many years, no one questioned the source of the feathers, and there was no mass media or internet to shed light on how those feathers were obtained. But eventually, some women's magazines began writing about them. When the attention started happening towards that, um, and people started picking up and saying, what's going on, are animals being killed? They, the, the general public still didn't know, but the milliners wanted people to think that everything was okay, and they were telling people, oh, we're taking the molten feathers, oh, we're taking the ones that are falling off, and we're taking them from the, the bottom of the rookeries. Well, of course that wasn't really happening because the ones that fell off, the molten feathers, were not so nice. A rookery is a breeding ground for birds, usually high up in a large tree. Some rookeries could hold as many as 500 birds or more. The Everglades are home to the great egret and snowy egret, but the craving for their feathers nearly resulted in their extinction, as well as other species of birds. And I'm not sure we fully grasp today what taking one uh, piece of the food chain out of that chain does to the remainder of it, but it clearly has a domino effect. And what we can say with certainty that over 100 years ago, about 120, 130 years ago, during this period of hunting of bird species, there were so many birds and so many species involved that it disrupted the entire ecosystem from top to bottom. Eventually, people began to take notice, particularly after news reached them about the murder of a Florida game warden who was shot to death by a plume hunter. A group of society women in Boston became particularly outraged by his murder. That group of women grew into the Audubon Society. The Audubon Society movement to, to stop the killing of the birds and to, to slow down the feathers, that started slowing things down. People started realizing, they started getting the word out. Little Audubon Society started you know, popping up all over the country from these society women having their teas and spreading the word and they were getting their husbands to get involved and it, and it really started moving. The Audubon Societies put pressure on the New York State Legislature, which passed the Audubon Plumage Bill in 1911. That law made it illegal to sell native bird plumes. It effectively ended the slaughter of native birds. The slaughter of egrets and other plume birds is the central theme of Harvey Oyer's book, The Last Egret. His family has been living in South Florida for five generations after moving here from Chicago in 1872. Back then, the family name was Pierce. And my great-great-grandfather was one of the assistant keepers of the Jupiter Lighthouse, and he stayed there for one year, and in 1873, they moved south into what would today be the center of Palm Beach County uh, in the middle of what we today call the Intercoastal Waterway. Historically, it was called Lake Worth. It was a long freshwater lake no inlets, and they settled on an island there called Hypoluxo Island. The island was named Hypoluxo by the Seminole Indians because Hypoluxo means water all around, no get out, an appropriate name for an island. We had no doctors, no hospitals, no newspapers, uh, no schools, no churches, no temples, uh, none of the things that we would associate with South Florida today. So it was a very challenging, rugged existence for them. But with all that said, and given all of the challenges uh, and deprivations they experienced, it had to just be a spectacular lifestyle. The woods were teeming with animals, and Lake Worth was clear, fresh water that was fit to drink. Well, when my family first moved here, there, uh, there was no one else here. You, and under the Federal Homestead Act, you could have 160 acres of land for free if you would make it your homestead. 
But while the land was free, there was no way to actually earn money. So the settlers raised crops and they caught fish and hunted wild animals to feed themselves. Over time, as we became more populated and, and still very lightly populated by today's standards, local government appeared and therefore taxes appeared. And a uh, property tax was instituted. And while it was a very nominal amount, certainly by today's standards, it was still onerous at a time when they had no income. With no way to pay the property tax, young Charlie Pierce began to think about how he might be able to help. A plume hunter passing by Hypoluxo Island told of huge egret rookeries to the south and the huge profits that could be made by killing the egrets for their feathers. But Charlie's father would have none of it. Though Papa was dead set against hunting birds for their feathers, even to save our home, I decided to make some opportunities for myself, and I began to plan for a great plume bird expedition into the Everglades. I tried to convince my friends Guy and Lewis Bradley to come along, but I also wanted to include my old friend Tiger, a native-born Seminole Indian. He'd be able to help us navigate the big swamp to find a special nesting place with hundreds of birds called rookeries. And if you think about it, we'll be just like real explorers, just like Lewis and Clark, and we'll go into the big swamp of Pahayoki. What do you think? Well, our parents will never let us go off like that. Pod whip was good. <laughs> Maybe, but what if he came back with a sack full of money? I don't know. You say we actually go into Pahayoki? I thought only the Indians went in there. I didn't think white men went into the swamp. Well, then, we'd be the first. Uh, except, Tiger, you've been there before, right? Yes, my people know Pahayoki. See if Tiger comes, we'll be with a real Seminole who's been there before, and you'll come along, right, Tiger? Where is Rookery? Paiyoki, very large. You know where Rookery is? Oh, well, not exactly. Charlie then brought out a map that showed the coast of Florida from north of Hypoluxo Island all the way down to Miami. Charlie figured they needed to sail south to Biscayne Bay and then go up the Miami River into the Everglades. I think initially when the idea of killing the plume birds and selling the plumes was presented to Charlie and his friends, it seemed like a pretty good idea. Uh, after all, they enjoyed hunting. Uh, it was a way to earn money and certainly a way to uh, earn money towards what Charlie perceived uh, his family might lose the island to property taxes. So I think initially uh, this seemed like a no-brainer uh, to them. To prepare for the secret expedition, Charlie stocked up on food supplies and ammunition. The four friends would borrow Uncle Will's boat, which hadn't been used much lately, but Charlie figured he could pay everyone back with all the money they would make. The last thing he did before leaving was to set a letter to his mom and dad on the kitchen table. Dear Mama and Papa, I know you'll be surprised when you find my bed empty and this letter on the table. Don't worry, I didn't get carried off by bears. Papa. I know you said you didn't want to plume hunt because it wasn't any way to make a living, but I'm not trying to make a living. I just want to make enough money to save our island. Please don't worry about me. I know what I'm doing. With love, Charlie. P.S. Guy and Lewis Bradley came along too, and we took Uncle Will's boat. I figured no one was using it for the time being. Charlie and his friends loaded supplies onto Uncle Will's boat and headed south to the Hillsboro Inlet on their way down Cypress Creek to Lettuce Lake. They had dreams of getting rich by killing hundreds, maybe thousands of birds for their valuable feathers. But what Charlie and his friends didn't really understand was how they, and the other hunters, would actually cause great harm to their environment. There's a circle of life, if you want to call it that. We call it, you know, the web, the chain of uh, food chain and so on. But in a Native American's perspective, it was the chain of life. It was the way that things were. One animal fed another animal so that the other one could survive. The boys spent the night near the inlet, but they weren't alone. Charlie's pesky little sister, Lily, had stowed away on their boat and demanded to stay with them. As always, she was full of questions. So, where are we going anyway? Lettuce Lake up Cypress Creek. What's there? Birds. So you're gonna shoot them when you find them? That's the general plan. How many do you think we'll find? As many as we can. They're worth a fortune, you know. Not all of them. Hi, 
can miss the birds. They're not worth as much. Can you stop pestering? That's not how you plume hunt, Willie. You just blast as many as you can, and then you sell them for what you can. What about the birds that aren't worth anything? What will you do with them? I don't know. Tiger, meanwhile, didn't say anything. He seemed to be deep in thought. He wanted to be part of the expedition and to help his friends, but the realization about what they were about to do clashed with what he had learned from his tribal elders. The Native Americans did use the animals in the forest and the plants to survive. If they did kill an animal, let's just say a deer, they used every part of the deer. They used the sinew, they used the muscles, you know, to eat with, they used the hide, even the horns for making weapons and so on, however they fashioned them, or uh, cooking and eating utensils. But when they did harvest an animal or an, a plant, they used every part of it, and they didn't use it just to slaughter an animal for no reason at all. But despite his upbringing and fully aware that he was doing something wrong, Tiger went along with his friends. These days, we would say that Tiger bowed to peer pressure. The young plume hunters soon came upon a creek and found themselves walking through cypress trees that were gigantic. And when they emerged from the cypress forest, they spotted a small hammock of trees not too far off. It was a rookery, and they made plans. You go that side, I go this side. I get the signal. Start blasting. When they were in position, they opened fire. It took nearly two hours to pick up all the bird carcasses. They bagged them up and used the sapling as a carrying pole. The boys had killed herons and ibis and cormorants, but no snowy egrets, whose feathers were by far the most valuable. So they decided to sail south to Miami, and even further south to Cape Sable at the bottom of the Florida Peninsula. After several more days of sailing, and then hiking through the swamp in waist-deep water, they found what they were after. The egrets! I found it, we did it! But not everyone shared Charlie's joy. Tiger's seminal upbringing caused him to once again rethink this expedition. And Lily too also questioned why they were planning to kill these beautiful creatures. Are you guys really gonna shoot those birds? Yep, that's what we came all this way for. But they're so pretty, and we've barely seen any snowy egrets. I mean, I could understand you shooting those herons and things we've got close by home, but how do you know that's not every snowy egret left in the world? That's just a girl thing to say. Of course there are more than just those. How do you know? Anyway, don't you think some things are just too pretty to be shot at? The boys were determined, but Lily was even more determined. When the boys weren't looking, Lily grabbed a bag full of shotgun shells. Get it back! She's got the bag of shells. She said she's going to throw them in the water if we leave to go kill them snow egrets. You shouldn't kill those birds. Lily, what are you doing? Give back the shells. You can't take our shells. We don't think you should go hunting today. Who's we? Me and Tiger. Right, Tiger? Didn't you see that they shouldn't kill any more birds? Tiger looked down at the dirt. He couldn't face his friends. But this expedition was Charlie's idea, and he wasn't about to back down. Charlie snatched the bag of shells from Lily. It's all right, Tiger. You don't have to come. Now, come on. Let's go. It took the better part of three hours for the three friends to cross the section of sawgrass that separated them from the egret rookery they came so far to find. The natural beauty of the area was awe-inspiring, and the boys were overwhelmed by what they saw. I've lived in wild places most of my life, but I've never seen a place like this. It almost seems like God was showing off his beauty and magic. And I wondered if the snowy egrets chose this spot for their rookery because it is the most beautiful place on earth. Suddenly, in the presence of all that majesty, I was overcome with doubts. What if these were the only snowy egrets left in the world? I knew if we shot these birds, we'd end up creating a pile of dead birds that we couldn't eat and leaving all those chicks to die just so a bunch of ladies I never met could put feathers on their hats. I had been raised to eat what I killed, 
not to throw away God's creations like so many used rags. Charlie's change of heart effectively put an end to the Great Plume Bird Expedition. But after their five-week trek through the Everglades, the youngsters did return with enough feathers to make a small profit. They split the money four ways because out of principle, Tiger refused to take his share. All of the children that participated in the Great Plume Bird Expedition into the Everglades were affected somehow by this experience and all of them wanted in their own way to really repent for what they had participated in and they all went about it in a different way. Guy Bradley may have been the most profoundly affected. He took his share and later moved south to Cape Sable near Flamingo to the same area he and his friends had plume hunted years earlier. He was hired as a game warden and spent his life tracking down and arresting plume hunters. On July 8, 1905, Guy Bradley was shot and killed by a plume hunter he was trying to arrest. The only good thing that came out of Guy Bradley's death was it caught America's attention. He was the first wildlife conservation officer in American history killed in the line of duty. And it caused not only people in Florida and America, but internationally to take notice that there's an issue here. His death also gave the Audubon Society ammunition in its fight against plume hunting. Congress eventually enacted federal laws to protect the birds, which culminated in the 1918 Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act. That law is still on the books today. So even today, these birds in the Everglades are protected against hunting but their flocks have still been decimated by man's tampering with the ecosystem. If we really want to be honest with ourselves, we are the problem. Moving more people into South Florida is a problem, and that is the great danger to the Everglades, is pollution, humans drawing the water supply down, and because of that, saltwater intrusion. It's not because we're shooting or killing animals, we're taking away their habitat. The Arthur R. Marshall Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge is just west of Boynton Beach. It began in 1951 and was named after Mr. Marshall, a crusader for the Everglades, in 1986. This is a place that people can get connected with nature again. And I just think just walking around outdoors here and just feeling the spirit of, the, of, of nature is just so fulfilling. And, um, I, and my hope, of course, is that children will get, experience that same feeling. And you know, if they have an, an opportunity to touch nature, they, they become connected. The refuge hosts school field trips and summer camps and serves as an educational handbook for the Everglades and for our future. I mean, we're not going to be able to breathe the air if we don't have trees, you know, that provide the oxygen. You know, we're not going to be able to survive if we don't have water that's clean, which can be cleaned by the vegetation that's out there, like the cattails soaking up all the phosphorus. And I, it's, everything works together and when people are able to come out and see that, they get an understanding and then they can go and they talk to their friends. Getting back to our young plume hunters, you may be asking whatever happened to young Charlie Pierce. During his illustrious life as a pioneer settler, he served in many capacities, most notably as one of the legendary barefoot mailmen who carried the mail from Palm Beach to Miami and then back again each week. He also served as the postmaster of Boynton Beach for 40 years. He died in 1939 at the age of 75, leaving an amazing legacy behind. In the few years after our great plume bird expedition, land values started rising rapidly, and our family made out just fine. Turns out Papa sold his land to that oil tycoon, Henry Flagler, who created a winter resort called Palm Beach for the rich and famous. As for me, I never shot another plume bird again. There are no other Everglades in the world. Nothing anywhere else is like them. By the time the desire for feathers on ladies' hats had subsided, egrets were on the verge of extinction. Thankfully, their numbers have returned, though even today they're still threatened by man's tampering with their habitat. And just as we saw in the program, Alan, education is definitely the key. We need to understand and to be reminded of the importance of all the creatures to our ecosystem. 
For WXEL, I'm Laurel Sauer. And I'm Alan Gerstel. We'll see you next time on Heritage. <laughs>